Hello, botanists. We are here to talk about APACE. This is the carrot family. This has a lot of well-known uh, species, including fennel and cilantro. Lots of interesting ethnobotany. Lots of good stuff, carrots, uh, and lots of bad stuff. Um, some medicinal stuff. The bad stuff comes in forms of poison, toxins, um, poison hemlock. Cilantro's in this family, like I said. Fennel. Uh, Carrots, I think I've said that too. The members of this family all have a really, really distinctive look. They have many small flowers that are in this form. Can you tell what type of inflorescence it is? Well, it kind of says it. Um, these are umbels. They're not just plain umbels though, they're compound umbels. And I love this picture that I got from the internet. They label kind of the smaller portion of the umbel an umbelit, like a nutlet right? From Baraginaceae, the little nut, or like a little pig, a piglet. I just love that word umbelit. It's adorable. I had never seen it before this picture. Anyway, a compound umbel is one of those that first kind of splits into different subunits, and then those themselves kind of split into smaller units, which is kind of hard to see in this picture. I'll show you lots more. Don't worry. Okay. Sometimes they've got bracts associated with um, either of the kind of levels of inflorescence. Sometimes they're more kind of globe shaped, other times they're more flat topped. And when we look at the flowers very closely, and actually here these are the fruits developing very closely, we see two fused carpels. You can kind of tell that from this picture. And this one is still hanging on to its petals. See those right there? Notice those petals, they're attached right here at this level or like on this one, the petals were attached right there. So you can kind of tell that this is an inferior ovary. And when we look more closely at the flowers, we can see a pretty clear floral formula. They're almost always gonna be actinomorphic, interestingly, except for the very outer flowers in the umbel. So in the kind of larger umbel, the very outside flowers of each kind of umbelit will have bilateral flowers sometimes, not always. They're either going to have five or zero sepals. They might be completely absent. They're going to have five petals, five um, stamens that are alternate, those petals. Those two fused carpels are of a, an inferior ovary. And then something we can see from this picture is that on all of the flowers, uh, essentially all of the flowers in this family are going to have this thing called a stylopodium, which is right there. The top of the ovary, above the inferior ovary, there's a nectary. This is where nectar is produced. It sort of looks like an inflatable tube or a raft just sitting right in the middle of the flower sometimes. Um, and it's always right there at the top of the ovary. There's one, there's one. And these are called, this is called a stylopodium. Cool. This is a family feature for APACE. Moving on, here's just some more looks of APAC. So here's a nice, another look at what a stylopodium can look like. Here, they look like they're almost kind of divided. That's from the two fused carpels. Just some more compound umbels. This one's got really obvious compound umbels. Now you can even see those sort of secondary peduncles, if you will, of this of each individual, or I guess those would be pedicels of each individual flower. And then these might be considered a secondary peduncle or something, and these the main peduncle. Yeah. When we look at those flowers more closely, th this one's a little interesting. It's got the petals completely recurved. That's that's definitely not a family feature. Um, but what we can see again is that stylopodium, kind of right up there, expanded, almost giving the impression of it being an ovary. When you first see these flowers, you might think, oh, there's the ovary right there. And it's not until you look more closely that you find that that's not where the ovules are. That's just where nectar is produced. It's, not, it's, it's underneath here. It's under these petals that we're going to see. Ovaries. Cool. Just another look. Um, oftentimes, uh, vegetatively in this family, we're going to have compound leaves at least deeply, deeply dissected usually. Very fancy, um, kind of simple to deeply dissected to, to compound leaves. And, oh yeah, the leaves, they have this very distinctive sheathing leaf base. The entire base of a leaf, which here is sort of the main part of the leaf up here, and then the petiole is right here, and then the way that it attaches 
to the stem is really broad. It almost wraps around, does it? It wraps around the stem, and they call that a sheathing leaf base. That must mean that this stem right here, oops, I'm going to do that in a different color. This stem right here is coming out of the axle, kind of right in here behind that sheathing leaf base, which means that's probably the axillary bud, and it's kind of shooting out a new stem right there. Okay, uh, sheathing leaf base, compound leaves, compound umbels. Cool. Lots of medicinal plants in this family, lots of poisonous ones in this family too. Uh, the fruits, I haven't talked about the fruits yet. What the matured ovary will become is a schizocarp actually, and you guessed it, it's got two mericarps. And here's another look at what happens. So the first sort of stage right as it's maturing is these two are still very close together, but then they split apart. These are, in theory, each of the carpels that are splitting. And so here would be one mericarp, and here would be the other mericarp. Right? But but the whole thing, this whole unit, kind of before it split, or if you consider them together, that's the schizocarp. That's the entire ovary. That's the whole fruit. The mericarp is just the sort of the seed dispersal unit. Those mericarps come in many different forms. Here's just another look. Sometimes they're uh, hooked. They have uh, a very hooked texture. Um, there's this one that I know very personally that's called the sock destroyer, in fact. It'll stick to your socks, and when you try to rip it out, it'll destroy the fibers of your socks. Uh, notice this, this little cluster of apiaceous mericarps has uh, apparently trapped this poor thistle fruit. So even in the fruits, you can tell that this plant kind of had a compound uh, umbel for its inflorescence. You might call this the infructescence in here, it's just those developing fruits. Okay, you've got two required species in this family, and yes, you do need to know the whole species. This is Dacus carota, wild carrot. It looks really similar from your other required species, which is Conium maculatum, which we're going to talk about next. That one is poison hemlock, so it is good to know the difference between these two. This one. Wild carrot, Dacus carota. It's also known as Queen Anne's lace. You might have seen it around town. It is a very common weed in Arcata. This is what it looks like up close. The compound umbel has very small flowers. Right beneath the major branches of this umbel um, are these things. What do you think these are? Yeah, those are inflorescence bracts. They clearly have really big, deeply dissected inflorescence bracts. You can't miss them. This is one of my go-to identification traits for this species. Here's another look at those inflorescence bracts. You just kind of flip over an inflorescence and you see each one of those really deeply dissected bracts. Something else we can see in this picture on the left is that every once in a while, not always, sometimes they will produce this one red flower right in the center of the compound umbel, in the compound umbel. And it'll be the oldest one, deep, deep red. And the story goes that Queen Anne was um, threading her lace and with a needle and she pricked herself and a drop of blood landed on these flowers and that's why it's called Queen Anne's Lace. Okay, and here's a picture of the flowers on the right, fruits on the left. What happens is the fruits have hooked mericarps. I'm gonna show you a picture in a second. They all kind of hook onto themselves. And so the fruits sort of look like a, uh, the infructescence, if you will, sort of looks like a bird's nest. Yeah. If we look at one of these mericarps up close, oops, I thought that was going to be the next slide. Uh, here's just another look at their leaves, um, deeply dissected leaves. Here's a better look. Fancy, fancy deeply dissected leaves. Those mericarps are hooked. So these will kind of stick to you. They'll stick to themselves or bird feathers, hopefully, from their perspective. Yeah. Their stem, when we look up close, is hairy. It's pubescent at the very least. Oh, that stopped. And uh, it's, it's entirely green. That's something that's going to be of note here pretty soon. Okay, here's your other required species, actually. It looks really similar. The leaves, again, are deeply, deeply dissected, very fancy looking. This time, though, the stem has purple spots on it. Now, these purple spots are not always on the stem. They tend to come in age. So we're talking about poison hemlock now, conium maculatum. 
here's another look at it. Inflorescence looks nearly identical to Dacus. But th they can get very tall. They, they can get about the same heights, except for Conium does tend to get taller. Notice here we do not have those inflorescence bracts. We do not have those large dissected inflorescence bracts in Conium. So again, that's, that's one of my favorite ID features to distinguish these two. Conium maculatum has the potential to get much taller, maybe up to nine or 10 feet, crazy. Now the whole thing is poisonous. Really any part of it has deadly poisons in it. Um, but the really poisonous parts are uh, concentrated in the maricarps and the kind of base of the plant. Um, and I think the flowers have a lot of it too. But the stem and the base of the stem kind of has really a lot of it. Um, it's, it's extremely, extremely toxic and it will kill you. It will um, kill you very slowly and painfully, in fact. And it is, uh, you might have heard that poison hemlock is the way that Socrates died. Yes, he was put to death and he kind of chose this, this way to die. Um, that's kind of one reason why hemlock is famous. And it's these maricarps that have a lot of the poison in them. These are the maricarps. Notice they don't have the hooks like Dacus. Instead, they have those ridges. Oops. Yeah, there it is again. Okay, and uh, here's this uh, chart that I want you to fill out. You might need to go back to the video. All right, and that is all I've got for you here. Uh, usually in the fall semester, we do this family on Halloween because it is scary because it is such a poisonous family. And I cannot stress that enough. Um, there are some edible members of this family, but it is not recommended to go out and try to find these things and identify them and eat them. You must be with a professional because you can easily misidentify um, something that is edible for something that is deadly, lethally poisonous. So for the rest of this video, I actually want to share with you a very scary yet true story. So I wanted to kind of Make it seem like we're at a really scary place, dark outside. Pretend like we're at the campfire. Join me by turning off the lights in your bedroom if you'd like, or waiting till night to watch this part. So this is the story written in 1915, very flowery language, about the mistake of <clears throat> ingesting water hemlock, which is a species in the genus Secuta in England, um, which was a mistake by kids who thought they were um, looking at wild parsnip. So here is the story. Trigger warning, child death. About the end of March, 1670, the cattle were being led from the village to water at the spring. In treading the riverbanks, they exposed the roots of this secuta, whose stems and leaf buds were now coming forth. At that time, two boys and six girls, a little before noon, ran out to the spring in the meadow through which the river flows, and seeing a root and thinking it was golden parsnip, not through the bidding of any evil appetite, but at the behest of wayward frolicsomeness, ate greedily of it. A certain one of the girls among them commended the root to the others for its sweetness and pleasantness, whereas the boys especially ate quite abundantly of it. They joyfully hastened home. One of the girls tearfully complained to her mother that she had been supplied too meagerly by her comrades with the root. Jacob Mater, a boy of six years, possessed of white locks and delicate though active, returned home happy and smiling, as if things had gone well. A little while afterwards he complained of pain in his abdomen. Then, scarcely uttering a word, he fell prostrate on the ground and urinated with great violence to the height of a man. Presently, he was a terrible sight to see, being seized with convulsions and with the loss of all of his senses. His mouth was shut most tightly so that it could not be opened by any means. He grated his teeth, he twisted his eyes about strangely, and blood flowed from his ears. In the region of his abdomen, particularly in the neighborhood of the sternum, a certain swollen body, the size of a man's fist, struck the hand of the afflicted father with the greatest force. He frequently hiccuped. At times he seemed about to be vomit. Uh, he seemed to be about to vomit, but he could force nothing from his mouth, which was most tightly closed. He tossed his limbs about marvelously and twist them, twisted them. Frequently his head was drawn backwards and his whole back was curved in the form of a bow, 
so much that a small child could have crept beneath him in the space between his back and the bed without touching him. When the convulsion ceased momentarily, he implored the assistance of his mother. When they returned with equal violence, he could be aroused by no pinching, by no talking, or by no other means, until his strength failed and he grew pale. Then a hand was placed on his breast, and he breathed his last. These symptoms continued scarcely beyond a half hour. After his death, his abdomen and face swelled so that only a little was noticeable about the eyes. From the mouth of the corpse, even to the hour of his burial, green froth flowed very abundantly, and although it was wiped away frequently by his grieving father, nevertheless, new froth soon took its place. So I hope you enjoyed that scary yet true story, and I hope at the very least you learned to never ever eat a plant that you are not 100% confident that you have identified correctly as an edible plant, especially in APACE. Okay, thanks. See you next time.